Thank you. You know, I'll tell you a quick story as I'm getting ready to get set up. You know, it's always amazed me, regardless of uh, your age, it's always amazed me that God has a time for people to understand. Hold on that, will you, Evan? To understand his gospel, to understand who he is. And, and I've tried figuring out. Um, my daughter Katie was a preacher's kid, and she knew all about Jesus, but she didn't really count it. Turn these lights, just, they're a little bit bright on me right now. Just tone them down a little bit, thanks. She didn't really get it until her freshman year of college. And she went away to college, and uh, a little rebellion. Uh, you know, hey, Dad, you don't know what you're talking about. Mom, you don't know what you're talking about. And then uh, she went to hear a speaker speak one night by herself. She'd asked her friends to go with her as a Christian speaker. And nobody would go. And on that cold night, she realized that Jesus was who he said he was. And that he loved her. And that her life would never be the same again after that night. So what I've always realized is when I step up on a stage like this, every single time, bar none, for 30 years, there's been somebody in that room at that time that God says, today's your day. Today I'm speaking to you. Not the person to the left of you, not the person to the right of you. But I'm just speaking to you. And like I said, it may not be your time today. Maybe you're too immature, quite honestly. Maybe the world revolves around you too much. Uh, maybe you won't listen. Maybe you're not broken yet. Maybe you haven't experienced much of the world. Or maybe you have and you're, you're too broken. But there's a time where God wants to speak to your heart. And I think if you open it up today, and I'm speaking to the tech team, I'm speaking to the band, I'm speaking to every parent here, I'm speaking to every single student here. God loves you, he cares for you, and there's a time where you'll have to make a decision, one way or the other, accept or reject, no offense, and uh, maybe today's that time. Back to basics, that's the series we're in right now, so I'm going to answer a question for you as best I can that has been asked me, it's the most popular question that's asked and sometimes not asked, and here's what it is. Why did God send his son to die? Why? That's a great question. Why did God send his son Jesus to die? Why wasn't there another way to forgive people? Why, wasn't there, why do you need to say, presto, boom, you're all forgiven? Why do you have us go touch a, a wall? If we touched a wall, we were forgiven. Why did he have to send Jesus, and why did Jesus have to die? Uh, that's the question we're going to answer. So if, you've, if you're one of those people that says, you know, I don't know why we talk about Jesus all the time, or why did God have to send Jesus, then if you just listen, then maybe the Spirit of God, not me, something inside is going to say, this is true, daughter. This is true, son. And now what are you going to do with it? What decision are you going to make? So we're going to go that way. Here's where we're at. If I threw uh, this tomato up in the air, threw it up in the air, threw it up 10 feet, where is it going to go after 10 feet? Say it loud. Down. Why? Gravity. Exactly right. I mean, I, again, I don't know how it goes up, but it's going to come down. It's not going to keep going up. It's gravity. That's just, that's just the way that it is. You agree with that? Now, I don't understand it, but it's just the way that it is. I, I, have to, I accept it because that's the way that it is. Uh, how many days are in a year? Why? No, no, there's a reason. But that's, we'll get back to that one in a second. Why? That's how long it takes the earth to make its orbit, right? Right? Am I right about this? You guys are educated, right? You know that. 365 days. How long is it going to take next year? 365. Now, why? Now you can say it. It's just the way that it is. It's the way that God made it. I can't even make a statement for this. Here's two statements. If I throw something in the air, it's going to come down. That's just the way that it is, and science even proves it. So I'm not even going to, I'm going to pull science into this one. Science proves that. Correct? I throw it up. Almost everything I throw up sooner or later is going to come back down because of gravity. Science proves it. I know that there's 365 days in a year. Why? It's the way it is, and science proves it. I know that there will be 24 hours in a day. Why? You can tell the scientific reason of it, but you know why. And that's just the way that it is. Okay. So with that said, science proves that it's just the way that it is. If we made salsa... I've got the ingredients of salsa. I want you guys to say these words with me. Say salsa. Look at somebody next to you and say salsa. It is a great word to say. You can say it twice more. Say salsa, salsa. It's a fun word. We have a tomato. Say tomato. How many call it a tomato? Tomato. 
We have a red onion. How many of you guys know the difference between a red onion and a white onion? Taste and color. Yeah, simple, right? We have a green pepper grown from my garden. Okay. And we have some cilantro. How many of you guys like cilantro? How many of you guys like cilantro? No? Okay, good. We have cilantro. It's not, it's not really cilantro. It's really celery. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> I couldn't find cilantro. I didn't want to go buy cilantro for this one. Here's the point. Every one of these things had a life source at one time. The tomato was on a vine. Right? We take this, we cut it off. This is from my garden too, true. We take it off. It can stay like this for a while, then it eventually begins to what? Rot. And if we left it like this for a month, it would be nasty, it would be dark, it would be de- dying, it would be dead. When we take it away from its life source, it dies. It's the same thing with the onion. When we pull it out of the gram, ground, it's the same thing with the, with the pepper. When we cut it off, it's the same thing with the celery uh, when we pull it up. All those things uh, have a life source, Right? Do they all have a life source, yes or no? I mean, we're going to try and get back to the basics right now. You've got to answer me boldly. Do all, were all those things at one time living? Yes. yes, they were. They had a life source. All those things now dying. I mean, we can push it a little bit. They're decaying is what I'll say. All right, that's a true statement. Taken from its life source, all those things will begin to die. All right, here's a question, next question for you. How many of you guys like to eat? How many of you guys like Mexican? Okay. We're going to come out here today and we're going to have all the salsa put away. You're going to go to your groups. But when you come out, you can eat all you want. You can test all, taste all of them you want. Eat as much as you want. We have plenty. I like Mexican too. Um, why do you eat though? I'm just, just asking a question. If you don't eat, you will what? Die. Say it again. This is a basic. If you don't eat, you will what? I know this seems basic, but it's true. If you don't eat, you will die. Amen. All right, so you can like to eat, but if you don't eat, you'll die. If you eat any of these vegetables, at one time they were connected to a life source, yes? All right, what if you eat chicken? It was one time living, correct? So really, when you eat chicken, it is nothing more than dead chicken, chicken that's been killed. When you go to Chick-fil-A, you're eating what? Dead chicken, dead chicken. If you go to get a hamburger, you're eating what? Dead cow. One time it went moo, moo, whack! It's no longer living, it's dead. We can say the same thing about fish. Now, here's something I want you to get, and you've got to zone in on this, because this is going to help answer the question. Everything that we eat that's any good for us was once alive. All of you are right now in a generation that says, eat organic. There's, it's better for you. It's more natural. If you eat things that were not one time alive, that, like a Twinkie, they never die, but they're not good for you. Correct? So for you to live, is this right? For you to live, you have to eat something that was one time living. Or for you to live, something has to die. Say that. For me to live, something has to die. Look at the person next to you and make that statement. Now we're all going to say this together. For me to live, something has to die. That's just the way it is. Look at the person next to you. You may not like it that this tomato is going to rot when we take it away from its mommy tomato and its baby tomato, but that's what's going to happen. You may not like it that when you had Chick-fil-A, it was once a living chicken, but that's, it's just the way that it is. And for me to live, for you to live, something has to die. If something doesn't die, all of us will eventually die. It's just the way that it is. Science proves it. God made it that way. It's just the way that it is, just as much like gravity, just as much like our calendar, just as much as like how many hours are in a day, that's just the way that it is. For you to live, something has to die. Yes? Let's get a little Christian in here. The word amen means strong agreement. For you to live, something has to die. Amen? Amen. 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 It has to be that way. You don't have to like it. Let me give you a cycle. You learn this probably when you're in fifth grade. I don't know when they taught it, but I'm guessing around that time period. It's called the ecosystem. There's a little worm in the ground. He's just like, you know, digging everywhere. And all of a sudden, a bird sees him from up in the air. Whoop, 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 he goes down there. What's he do? Snatches that little bird in its mouth, puts it in his mouth. And what does that bird do to that worm? He eats it. Is the worm longer in, in, living in it longer? No, it's dead. 
It's dead, but that's what fed the bird, and now the bird's alive. All of a sudden, the bird sees some bird food that somebody's laid out, and he goes over to get the bird food. But Mr. Cat sees the bird, and boom, he's hungry, so he eats the bird. There's nothing now more than feathers. Now, is the bird dead? Yeah. How many of you guys like cats? Yeah, they're mean. They eat birds and everything else, right? So that cat did that. Then all of a sudden, something happens. The cat, boom, has a heart attack. Out of nowhere, the cat's out eating birds and so forth, and it dies in the ground. And you, you don't see your cat. Your cat went away. You say, sweetie, we haven't seen Kitty for a couple weeks. Where's Kitty? You don't ever see Kitty again because here's what happens to Kitty. Kitty decays. And when Kitty decays, Kitty goes into the ground. And do you know who eats Kitty? The grandson and the granddaughter of the worm. And then it starts all over again. Little bird sees the little worm. You understand that? So for things to live, something has to die. Say it with me. It's just the way it is. You don't have to like it. You just have to believe it because it's true. You accept it. Science proves it. That's just the way that it is. It's just the way that it is. It has been said, in fact, by some theologians and some scientists that death is the engine of life. Isn't that crazy? For you to live, something really has to be cut off from its life, so something has to die. It's just the way that it is. Again, I'm not asking you to like it, but it's the truth. Death sometimes is the engine of life. And here's what I'd say. God just made it that way. God, why didn't you make it where we can breathe and we can get all the vitamins and all the protein that we need out of the air? I don't know. He didn't make it that way. He made it where the animals, they give us nourishment. The vegetables that were one time growing and thriving have to be taken off the vine. Some, they have to be cut off from their life source. He just made it that way. That's the way that it is. And you know what? You don't have to admit it, but if you eat, you already believe this. Some of you eat certainly out of enjoyment, but I can tell you one thing. You guys ever watched Naked and Afraid? You guys ever watched that? How many of you guys like Naked and Afraid? Have you guys never seen it? Okay, well, that's weird, all right, go whatever you want. But here's the deal. If you went out far enough in the woods and you didn't have food long enough, you would eat worms. You would eat grubs. You would eat bugs. And do you know why? Because if you don't, what? It's just the way that it is. So this begs the question. Why did God send Jesus to die. But well, there should be one other question then. If God loves us and he wants us to have life with him, eternal life, then might it just also be that God says for you to live, something has to... Wow, why don't you just forgive people? Why don't you just say, boom, they're forgiven. Go run and touch a wall, you're forgiven. And I think God would say, I didn't make it that way. You don't have to accept it. You don't have to even understand it. But it's the way that it is, and it's true. So you can imagine this. Listen to some of these scriptures. With that backdrop of understanding, God said, I made it from the beginning this way. For something to live, something must die. And for something to live eternally, something very big and precious has to die. Romans 5, 8, Paul wrote this to Christians in Rome. Listen to this one. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, while we were still separated from God, Christ died for us. Let's read that out loud together. But God demonstrates out loud his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now I go on. Paul wrote this to a church in Corinth, just like a church like here, like in, in Arnold. Only it's called Corinth. Paul says this, For what I received, I passed on to you as the first importance. He said, What I learned, I'm telling you now. And here's what he said, That Christ died for our sins, according to our scriptures. See, our sins separate us from God eternally. Our sins bring death into our life. And here, Paul's saying, Well, Christ came because you know what? For you to live, something has to die. Then Peter made this statement. The apostle Peter 1 Peter 3.18, 1 Peter 3.18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous, the right standing with God for the unrighteous us, 
to bring you to God, to bring me to God. He was put to death in the body and made alive in the spirit. Maybe, just maybe, and we'll see in a second, maybe the reason that God sent Jesus is because he loves you so much that something very precious had to die for something very precious to live. And that's you. And that's just the way that it is. That's how God made it. Death giving life is true everywhere. It's been that way since centered into the world, and it's just the way that it is. Again, death is the engine of life. Well, so you should ask a question. Well, well, does that mean anything more to me than this? Well, certainly it does. There's a couple things. And hopefully your small group will talk about it a little bit more. And you'll have a better chance to explain how you feel. I'm going to say this again. Today is somebody's day. My daughter Katie's day was a freshman year in college. Somebody's day today to understand where you get at this now. Jesus made this statement in Matthew 20 through 26. One thing to learn about death. He said, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. See, the apostles, they wanted to lord over everybody. They wanted to have life to its full. And Jesus said, for you to have life to your full, to be fully living, something has to die. And you know what's the best thing to die? Your selfishness. See, when you serve other people, you put yourself second. You die to yourself and you put others first. And when you do that, they live better. Let me give an example. Don't raise your hand. Some of you have parents, some, that are not good parents. You know they're not. They're selfish. They only serve themselves. They might have left you. They might have left your mom. They might have left your dad. I don't know the situation. But you know that because they don't die to themselves, that something is dying inside of you. It might be your heart. It might be your compassion. It might be your faith. And if they would just die to themselves and start to serve you and your family more, then you would live. And you know that and you've seen it. Can I just make this statement? That's why a selfish person's world gets so small. Selfish people don't have a lot of friends because their world is dying. It's dying. It's dying. And when you become where you're a servant, where you serve other people joyfully, not out of somebody dominating you, but where you joyfully say, I want to serve, I want to be like Christ because I want my world to grow. Jesus says, he says, the least of these will be the greatest in my kingdom. And you know, if, if your mom or your grandma or your friend is a person that likes to serve, you know their world grows. They've got plenty of friends, they've got plenty of people. And I'll just make this statement, then we'll move on. Selfish people suck life out of people rather than give it. That's what selfish people do. And I just would say this to you today as part of this part one. Don't be that. Don't be a life taker. Be a life giver. At the earliest age you can. Can I just say this for you? I love both my kids. Matt, for whatever reason, who's now down in Atlanta, he got this early. We'd be at the movie theater. I never have to ask him one time to say, hey, Matt, could you take out all the trash from the movie theater? Now, most of the times, the trash at that movie theater when we were there six years ago over in Keller wasn't just our trash. It was trash from the night before and the popcorn and all the other stuff. Matt, in sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth grade, no problem, he would do it. And Josh was the same. It didn't surprise me when their world got bigger and bigger and bigger because they got the servant's heart early on. When we die to ourselves, our life gets bigger, and it's more people enter into it. Serious followers of Jesus know their world is getting bigger and bigger as they serve more and more people. Maybe the cross, listen to this, maybe the cross is saying to you, that cross that you got when you came in, is saying to you, do you want to die to some of the stuff inside of you? Do you want to die to selfishness? Maybe that's something you have to write on the cross and say, God, I don't want to be selfish. I don't want to be like you. Pick whoever it is. I don't want my world to shrink. I don't want it to get small. Well, there's some other things I think that the cross is saying about death. There's some junk inside of you guys right now that you already have that has to die. It has to go away. 
had a um, kid the other day. I was sitting at Culver's, and he's on the other side. We're in the, the booths. I can't see them, and they can't see me, but he's with his mom and, a, and, a, and another, uh, look like a brother and a sister. And his mom says, how are your grades doing? And he says, well, I'm, I'm trying to get it up to a 1.6. My GPA right now is 1.4. And she says, well, you've got to improve that. He says, I can't improve it. I'm stupid. I'm dumb. And I wanted to reach so badly across the thing and say, your grade point average isn't an indicator of your, of your worth or your smartness. You're made like God. And you have more value than anything in the world. And I wanted him just to die to ever saying again that he was dumb and stupid. Because if he, if he lets that take over him, that thing about believing he's actually dumb, worthless, it will kill him. Maybe not tomorrow. But it will destroy so many relationships in his life. Some of you need to let go of Selfishness. Some of you need to let go of your pride. Some of you need to let go of your anger towards your parents or a parent. You need to write that on the cross. You say, I got to kill that because if that dies, then I can grow and live and I can replace it with better things, with compassion, forgiveness. That's what the cross says when I look at it all the time. Some of you got to stop comparison. You are enough. If there was not one other person on planet Earth, Jesus would come for you because you're that special and that unique and that good. You are enough. Here's a question. Is there something in your life that is in the way of you living that has to die, that has to die? A pain, a fear. Maybe the cross that you've got is something that you've got to examine that as you go on. Colossians 3, 5 through 11. Paul says this to the church of Colossae. I'm going to wrap this up just in a minute so if the band is ready, they can come right back out. Colossians 3, 5 through 11. Listen to this. Listen to how wise this is. And again, it's my guess that God's saying this to one of you here or up in the tech booth or out in the foyer. He says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual morality. Put it to death. Stop it. Say, I'm not going to do that. That's not where I want to be. Impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, idolatry. Put those things to death so that you might live because that's just the way that it is. For you to live, something has to die. Romans 8, 13. For if you live according to the flesh, if you live according to wanting everything that you feel, you will die, he says. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Some of you have control issues you've got to stop. Whether it's cutting or pulling out your hair or picking parts of your body numbing out through alcohol or drugs. You've got to write that and say, that has to die for me to live. I can say this with the utmost confidence that God wants every single one of you to live fully. Every single one of you. And the cross says, some things just have to die and we have to let them. And maybe today that's for you. Romans 8.32 he who did not spare his own son, that's God, but gave him up for us all, how will we not also, along with him, graciously gives us all things? Meaning God gave us Jesus. He gave us Jesus' death so that we may live. In a moment, we're going to sing a song. But I want this to become a holy place, a place that's set aside. And I want you to, to think about something that God's prompted in your mind, that you know it's, it's time. I don't have to struggle with this popularity. I've got to let that die. I don't have to struggle with fear. I've got to let that die. I don't have to struggle with worry, anxiety, or depression. I've got to let that die. And maybe God's saying today, treasured daughter, treasured son, I brought you here tonight because this is your night. This is your night. Some of you need to accept the death of Jesus for you so you have life.
You just need to accept it. It's just the way that it is. You don't have to understand it fully. You just need to accept it just like gravity. Go to God right now for a moment. Father, hear the men in this room. On the right side, hear their heart. Hear their desire, their questions. Father, the men on the left side of the room, I pray that you hear them, you touch them. The people in the tech booth, the band, the people in the foyer, all men that are here. Hear what we're saying to you, God, as we've heard you speak, that still small voice inside of us. And dear Father, I pray for the women who are under such, such attack in our culture. Hear their heart. Hear what they know must die so that they can live. Dear God, I pray for the women on the left side and on the right side that you touch them. Dear God, may this place be just as holy as if we're standing before the foot of the cross and Jesus is on it. May we look at his death differently right now and understand for us to live, he had to die. There was no other way. It's the way you made it, God. It's always been that way. And you loved us enough to put the most precious Thing ever, your son, on that cross so that we might live and live fully on this earth and live fully forever. Dear God, I thank you that what Jesus did was sufficient to have us made right with you and we can accept that. I thank you, dear Father, that he was strong enough to become victorious over our sins and rise again. God, I'm going to ask one last thing. Might there be a name of somebody that's hurt somebody in this room? That that anger, that that desire for revenge, can we let that just die with their name today? If it's the name Bob or Dave or Mike or Cindy or Karen or whatever name, dear God, can we just let our right for revenge, our right for hurt, can we let that go away and let that die? Can you replace that with life? Can you replace that with more forgiveness and more peace and courage? God, we love you. We do not have to cry out to you. You are here with us. And Father, I thank you for the person or the people who this was an appointment tonight. May you extend this into the time period of their community. God, we get to sing one more song to you. May this continue to be a holy moment in a holy place. I thank you for this, God. And all God's people said, amen. Let's stand and sing.